Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, would the Senator yield for the author yield for a couple Senator of questions? Senator Dibble will yield. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam President and, uh, and members and, and Senator Dibble for yielding. Uh, uh, I'm not going to belabor this, uh, uh, this issue of, of uh, medical uh, what's been now called medical, uh, was formerly medical marijuana, now cannabis. Uh, but, Senator, I do have some, uh, I think, legitimate questions, and I think it's clear now that the felony offense that would, uh, that would uh, for a designated caregiver that would, that would uh, disqualify somebody is a federal drug offense, apparently by federal or state statute. So that, that, that I've answered myself here. The ID cards uh, uh, that were in the Senate, Senate file seem to be a, a reasonable way to be able to uh, monitor and check for, uh, for having possession of, uh, of this substance. Um, can, you, can you take me through that, uh, uh, Senator, if you would, just how that, that's going to work for the workings of, a, of, of someone who wants to go get this and how when they turn up at the... Uh, uh, at the place where they're going to they're going to buy their medication, how do they check on them to make sure that's the person? Is it through an ID card of some kind, or is it photo ID, driver's license? Can you take the, the members through that, please? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Madam President, uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen. That is not a provision that we uh, um, that that was in the Senate bill that was not picked up. That was not in the House bill and was not picked up in the conference committee report. Um, uh, a person um, uh, the the. Commissioner is tasked to work in conjunction with the uh, manufacturers on a verification system, um, but the specifics are not articulated around that. Um, I mean, it could be an ID card um, at a minimum. Um, you know, all of the all of the unique identifiers for uh, an individual, as well as their caregiver, and the caregiver, uh, you know, of course, needs to be attached to a particular uh, individual. Um, are set forth in the bill. Um, and so, you know, that, of course, would, you know, be a, 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 com a computer-based uh, verification system. Um, and then the person would need to verify who they are, I think, through some normal standard of, of identification, uh, whether that's a Minnesota-based ID or something uh, like that. It could perhaps be a, a card that, that's developed, um, but we le leave some of those details to be determined by um, the commissioner in conjunction with the uh, manufacturer. There is a verification system, but the card system that you describe isn't specifically spelled out. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam President. And, and some, a couple of follow-up questions. So there is no, no, no real verification is what you're saying, and, and I, I understand that, and it's changed a lot from, from, uh, from your bill previously. So it, it becomes somewhat of a problem as far as identifying uh, who actually is, is uh, um, carrying the prescription, if you will. Uh, the other question I have, moving down, uh, if I could, Madam, Madam President, uh, Senator Dibble, uh, would he yield for a couple of more questions? Senator Dibble please? will yield. Senator thank, thank you, Madam President. And the bottom of line, page 3, line 334, allowing the commissioner to, uh, to approve other medical treatments or other medical conditions. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? I'm asking specifically... Uh, uh, would would back pain, severe back pain, or migraine headaches, uh, things like that, would that be eliminated, or would the, could the commissioner actually give someone a, a permission to to obtain this medication for a migraine headache or severe back pain? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, Senator Ingebrigtsen, there's a there is a process spelled out um, uh, for which the um, Commissioner can undertake adding uh, conditions. So uh, the answer to your question is today, uh, no. Uh, but you know, unless of course the pain is connected to cancer or terminal illness. Um, uh, however, um, should uh, should there be some determination at some point in the future that that's a, a good idea? Um, uh, you can look at uh, page eight, line starting with line three. If the commissioner wishes to add a delivery method or a qualifying medical condition, uh, they must first notify the chairs and ranking minority members of the legislator, legislature, um, and, and reasons uh, include written comments received from the public and guidance received from the task force uh, on uh, medical cannabis research, and then allow for and do that by January 15th of a given year allow for the legislature to meet in session uh, and then uh, that condition uh, would then become effective after the legislature has had a chance to meet in session and of course presumably act 
in the in the negative or in the affirmative to affirm the addition of that condition. Thank you. Thank Senator, you, Madam. Senator thank, Ingebrigtsen. You, thank you, Madam President, and Senator Dibble. Thank you for that answer. And uh, the um, next question I have is, and I think it's important to members to know that the, that, and you comment on it on, on a, um, several di different diagnoses are going to be eliminated from the. Uh, from having uh, the ability to obtain this medication. Can you tell me now uh, that there were, uh, under your bill, uh, the MMB had stated that there were 35,000, potentially 35,000 people that were in need of this medication in the state. What is the number now that actually will probably be using this? I've heard figures of, of much less than this, uh, figures of five to 7,000 uh, patients potentially. Uh, that's quite a difference. Can you can you elaborate on that at all, or do you have any numbers for me, Senator Tibble. Um Thank you, Madam President, and I think Senator Ingebrigtsen, you're you're correct. I think uh, uh, Senate File 1641, as passed uh, by the Senate a few days ago, I did have an estimate of around 35,000. I think some folks thought that that was a little bit uh, generous because it was based on the experience of Arizona. Um, that had a slightly more expansive list and a slightly different demographic and population base um, than, than Minnesota. Um, uh, so folks thought that was maybe a little bit, like I said, uh, generous for 1641, but it's probably in the ballpark. Um, and the estimates of the original House file uh, remain somewhat similar, um, although we did add to the, the House file um, list a, a little bit with the, the you know the the pain and the and the wasting and the nausea at, attached to terminal illness and attached to to cancer, but I think it remains in the in the ballpark of five to seven thousand folks. So I think you're right on that. Thank you, uh, thank you for that, Madam President. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Another question, please, uh, for the yield, uh, Senator. You will yield, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Senator, take me through the process of of uh, and and there's there's some alarming statistics out there about children having access to medication in, in states the 21 or 22 states that have uh, medical uh, marijuana can you take me through the process if if a child has has had access and does have access to this and this will happen members I mean we all know this is going to happen I'm not going to say it's going to happen on a regular basis but nevertheless it will can you take me through the process as to how someone could follow up with that with the registry numbers registration system that you have in your bill how would a parent follow up on that how would how would a uh, how would a law enforcement officer follow up on on something like that do you, th do you feel that the bill is secure enough that they would they would be able to follow that and track that back to somebody who might be either giving that to them or making it accessible for them to actually steal it and I think that that might be the case, not necessarily dealing so much more than just having access. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, uh, well, Senator Ingebrigtsen, um, you know, I think we might disagree a little bit on um, the uh, extent of a, a problem like that that would occur as a result of this bill. Um, the commissioner is tasked with uh, developing rules to minimize diversion and and uh, and medical. Cannabis getting into the hands of people who shouldn't have it um, uh, in a number of different ways, um, you know, both uh, at the facility, um, also, uh, you know, making sure that uh, folks have responsibility uh, for uh, ensuring the, the safekeeping, you know, so there's some personal responsibility elements with some accountability, um, but also um, uh, the packaging requirements, um, I think, are pretty robust uh, with, with labeling. Um, that includes all of the relevant information uh, on the label um, that relates to the unique identifier and the verification system, um, uh, you know, to whom this, this belongs, making sure it's secure, you know, child-proof, you know, rises to the level of an industry-developed standard uh, for, or for poison packaging, uh, et cetera. Um, and then finally, um, there is a... Uh, uh, back on Section 19 of Rules and Adverse Incidents uh, to make sure that uh, when folks uh, do uh, come into possession of, of uh, secure uh, medical cannabis, um, first of all, that, that professionals uh, have some responsibility uh, uh, to, to, to secure it back, uh, to take some steps to do that, um, but also that uh, we keep track of, of those sorts of in incidents um, so we'll have some knowledge about the extent of that problem, some real data. And then just finally, I'll say, you know, it, we don't spell out 
um, a whole lot of specifics around that beyond what I, what I just described, um, but that's a very you know similar uh, issue that we face in uh, just regular pharmaceuticals today. So this, this is not a unique circumstance or situation that we all need to be aware of um, as responsible people uh, that deal with uh, potential pharmaceuticals and, and substances that might help us um, that that shouldn't be in the hands of other people. Is there any more discussion? Senator Franson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Senator Dibble, I want to start by thanking you and commending you for bringing this bill forward. As many of you know, that this bill I like to describe was on life support all through session, and it took a lot of courage from the stakeholders, the governor's office, and the governor in particular to come through and supporting this bill. Um, and I look forward to voting for it. Uh, I think it's going to bring a lot of benefit to many, many families who are suffering in our state. And I wish we'd have gone a little bit further, but I think. Uh, we struck a good compromise, and that's what we're all about here, to do the best we can to uh, tackle those concerns that people have had all along. And I think we are, today are landing in a good place, and I look forward to supporting this bill. I do have a few questions for Senator Dibble, so if he would yield. Senator Dibble will yield. Senator Franson. Thank you, Madam Ch uh, President. Uh, I did read through the bill and noticed a, a few protections and a few, uh, some of the language, um, and I just want to clarify some of the language when it pertains to uh, potential enforcement from employers. There's protections of no discrimination in uh, page 17, section um, subdivision 3. Section 12, um, I do notice that some of the definitions um, that I'd like to see in the beginning of impaired, impairment was not defined in the bill, but I do want to address that um, that might be something we want to look back to next year and potentially um, having more clarity in what that means um, with, with particular emphasis, for instance, if an employer um, has an ability to um, enforce their employment laws and, and, and discipline and so forth and their policies, um, we'd like to see more clarity on what that would mean. Uh, but overall, I, I, I think we've struck a, a good balance. I do like to clarify with Senator Dibble, um, when it comes to management or utilizing equipment, operating equipment, and this is uh, further in Section 3, it talks about nothing in this bill would permit any person to engage in or does not prevent imposition of any civil, criminal, or other penalties for uh, subsection 4, line 4.16, operating, navigating, or being in actual physical control of any motor vehicle, aircraft, train, or motorboat, or working on transportation property, equipment, or facilities while under the influence of medical cannabis. Um, in terms of equipment, Senator Dibble, would this cover, for instance, uh, the operation of a forklift? Is it the intent of this bill to cover um, those type of equipments that you would normally see in a workplace? And would a employer be able to uh, enforce their own policy policies to not uh, put at risk uh, the safety of their employees and um, others around them and the uh, overall public, would this be, would this bill do anything to change um, an employer's policies when it comes to enforcing their own um, policies in, in, in place in terms of um, safety um, with this bill? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, and uh, the short answer to uh, Senator Franzen's question, and, and thank you for the question, so that we can clarify that uh, for the legislative record, because I know this has come up in a conversation uh, earlier today. Uh, the short answer is no. Um, I would point members and Senator Franzen to a couple of spots in the bill. First of all, under that limitation section that, that to which you refer, section three, uh, the most of which is on page four, um, uh, nothing, uh, 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 folks cannot use uh, medical cannabis um, uh, to undertake any task under the influence that would constitute uh, negligence or professional malpractice. Uh, in terms of impairment or influence to your first uh, question or first comment, 
Um, you know, we may need to go back and do further definitions, but I don't think so because I think we take the commonly accepted meaning and or refer to other parts of, of the statutes to understand what influence and impairment mean. Um, and then uh, to your specific question around um, operating equipment and the like, um, I think the answer to your question is, uh, is to affirm that indeed employers' rights are not in any way inhibited um, if, if they should be concerned about someone who's using cannabis uh, for medical purposes um, and that might represent uh, an unsafe circumstance or situation at work, um, they can exercise all of the responsibilities and rights um, that they have. And then finally, um, you know, back in section uh, 17, or back on page 17 in the, uh, in the non-discrimination uh, protections, um, there are, of course, uh, protections uh, for people in hiring, termination, terms of condition, employment, um, but um, not in those instances when a, a patient's uh, uh, impairment would occur on the premises of the place of employment or during the hours of employment. So I think we deal fairly thoroughly and comprehensively with some of the concerns that have been articulated. Senator Franson. Thank you, Madam President. One final follow-up question to that. Thank you, Senator Dibble, for that clarification. Would be, uh, would this particular bill, in terms of uh, medical cannabis being a prescribed uh, substance, would this be treated as a different prescribed substance from other other drugs that are currently prescribed that might cause drowsiness and so forth, or would this be um, a, a substance that will also be falling in line with any other prescription? Maybe clarifying more, um, would this be, um, would this bill provide any additional protections that you would, or, or, or treat uh, medical can cannabis differently than any, any other prescribed substance at this point? Senator Tibble. Um, thank you, Madam President. Um, Senator Franzen, you know, I, I, think, uh, I, I think I understand the gist of your question, and, and the answer to your question is no, there would be no different treatment per se. Prescription and prescribing, of course, is a term of art. Um, in, in this instance, there would not be a prescription per se. That's a, a, a legal uh, a phrase um, uh, that, uh, uh, that has um, specific uh, federal and, and state law implications. And so um, folks... Um, would be diagnosed with a particular illness and then, of course, gain access to the registry and then work with their doctor on figuring out uh, what the best course of action is along with the pharmacist at the, at the facility. But in terms of, of how this is regarded in places of employment um, or, or, other, or use in public and that sort of thing um, for the purposes that you described, I think the answer is no. There's, there's no real difference. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Madam President. Members, you're lucky. I, uh, I had the bill. I read it. I marked it up, and now I can't find it. So, Senator Dibble, you're lucky. <laughs> I had a bunch of questions. <laughs> so I will just re reserve my comments on, on just a few items, members. And, and one is that we are, we are dealing with a Schedule Five drug here, folks. This is a very serious drug. And it is Schedule Five because the FDA, one of the best uh, agencies to evaluate and approve uh, the use of medications of humans, especially for children, say it's Schedule 5. And we've taken it upon ourselves to say uh, what is the best approach for medication for humans and for children. There is something that's very serious here that's missing in this bill. And Senator Dibble, I, I, I brought this up when it first came to the floor, and that was the, the oversight um, on continuing um, ailments and conditions by the legislature. And I think that is very, very important. Although I do believe the commissioner that we have now in place, who is a pediatrician, a pediatrician by, um, by training and practice, is, is very good to lead this charge. But what about a future commissioners on down the road? And what are we going to have? And as we, can, as we know from other states that have dealt with this, you have 19-year-olds walking around with chronic pain conditions, and that's unacceptable. That just abuses the system, and I'm very, very concerned about it. So that is, that is Senator Dibble, an issue I wish we had taken seriously about making sure there is a stopgap, uh, a, a check, and a double check on making sure that these conditions that need to be addressed 
um, are reasonable and that we are reaching the right um, and appropriate patients. The other issue that I want to bring up is that we really don't have uh, a proper prescription monitoring program in place in the state now because of the House, but because <laughs> that is something that we need. We need to have a prescription monitoring program if this is going to be prescribed. And so we are, again, going to be looking at another drug that's going to be uh, doctor shopped. And I hope that is not the case, Senator Dibble. I hope that we don't see the same thing that's happened with the opioid addiction issue, where people can maneuver our, this system and get as much drugs and cannabis as they deem proper. I am very worried about that. We are going to have to strengthen our PMP, our prescription monitoring program laws in the future, because no matter how you, how you slice it, members, marijuana is still the number one addictive drug in the state, and it's growing in our younger sector. So we have to make sure that we come back next year and readdress this issue. The other thing that bothers me in the bill is there's no Board of Pharmacy oversight. And perhaps I didn't read it thorough, thoroughly, um, Senator Dibble, and if you can correct me on that, I would appreciate that. Um, the other thing that I, and I will make these comments brief, but I do find it a little bit disingenuous that we're talking about child safety for our e-cigarettes and making sure that we're protecting the public and we have this bill of medical marijuana, medical cannabis, that went through Rules Committee at the very late part of the session and uh, go, went through all the appropriate committees, yes, but there was very little uh, debate and involvement from all the stakeholders. And did you, anybody hear from MMA or AMA, uh, the American Medical Association or the Minnesota Medical Association, from the treatment um, community, from law enforcement, for goodness sakes. So this, this is a flawed piece of this legislation because all the stakeholders were not at the table. However, by reading the legislation, Senator Dibble, I will say that there was a lot of thought uh, put into the bill, and I'm, and I'm hoping that, and as I told my caucus, I'm hoping that we have a very strong medical cannabis legislation and that these concerns that I feel are very real, because I have been working in this drug issue for a very long time, that we make sure that we provide the best bill possible. If it's going to be signed by the governor, that we provide the best bill possible. Thank you. I have next Senator Peterson, then Senator Benson, then Senator Nelson, then Senator Westrom. Senator Peterson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Madam President and members, I actually didn't plan to say anything on this bill. I've already made my statements. I've made many of them. Um, uh, I do want to say, since I am um, to my friend from Minneapolis, thank you. Um, thank you for your work on behalf of 38,000 people who are just trying to live a better life and seek the treatment that they so desperately need. Uh, unfortunately, members, this bill does not help uh, those folks. This bill helps um, maybe, maybe 5,000 of them, and we're leaving the other 33,000 behind. And the reason, members, that we're leaving those 33,000 behind, 33,000 people who have stories that are just as compelling as the Weavers who testified in committee and the other stories that pulled at our heartstrings, 33,000 people who could tell a story equally as compelling. The reason we're in this position is because the governor has been completely unwilling to engage in an intellectually honest, meaningful, good faith conversation about this issue. And the reason I was compelled to speak is because of what I heard from Senator Franzen, one of the most untrue statements I have ever heard said in this chamber. Praising the governor for his courage on this issue? You've got to be kidding me. There is nobody who believes that. And 33,000 people will not get the treatment they deserve because of the governor 
You know, we started this session, and frankly, the legislative leaders, I believe, were trying to protect the governor on this issue. And to their credit, after the governor insulted every member of the legislature by saying we were hiding behind our desks on something that he knew full well we could pass and we supported, we obliged and we sent him a bill, and this chamber overwhelmingly supported a bill that would help those 38,000 people and was a great solution. And again, I commend Senator Dibble and all 48 of the members who supported that, that legislation. But the governor never got out from behind his wall of special interests, law enforcement interests, and others who he has listened to without fail throughout this, and has demonstrated zero courage and zero leadership. And I will not allow that statement, that untrue statement, to go without being challenged on this floor. Members, this bill is not what it could be, and it's not what it could be because of the governor. Representative Moline, Senator Dibble, Senator Benson, Representative Garofalo, and the countless other members of this legislature who supported a plan that actually worked for patients stood for those 38,000 people. But the one person who didn't, for certain, for certain, was Governor Dayton. Senator Benson. Thank you, Madam President, and I want to thank Senator Dibble. He has been um, very nice to work with, and I appreciate his allowing me to participate. Um, this bill is acceptable. It's not as good as it could have been. The Senate process was good. It was fast, but it was good. There was a lot of challenge and debate, but that is how we make good policy, and we had a good bill. And I want to thank the authors and the families and the advocates and the opponents for their leadership, their commitment, and courage. But as Senator Peterson pointed out, if the governor had shown leadership, commitment, and courage, we would have had a better bill here tonight. I will vote yes on a bill that could have been much better, but today it is acceptable. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam President, members. Well, there's no doubt there's been a lot of work uh, done on this medical marijuana bill. There's been a lot of passion, a lot of time, and a lot of energy invested in this. And yet, at the same time, I see that there's a little disconnect in the logic that's taking place uh, in this legislature, in the Senate chambers. On the one hand, we can't allow 64 ounces uh, of growlers of alcohol to be sold on a Sunday uh, in tap rooms. And we're concerned about e-cigs, and, and rightfully so, uh, because the information is not out yet about secondhand vapors from those e-cigs and how it affects the public. And yet, here we are right now talking about medical marijuana. And suddenly those arguments that we used on this chamber floor, uh, suddenly we have forgotten those. And they're not being considered. So I think there is a gap in logic here. And also, there's the underlying issue. In, in light of the all of the discussions that have gone on about medical marijuana in this uh, legislative chamber, yet the bill before us today, while much tighter than the Senate bill that passed out of this body last week, yet this bill before us today is based upon shaky ground. It's like building a house on sand. No matter how high you build the house, no matter how strong the construction of the house, when it is built upon sand without a foundation, it does not stand. And members, that's a problem with the legislation that we're looking at today. 
It is not built upon the foundation of science, clinical randomized trials that determine medical prescribing, which ingredients are effective and for which conditions, and at what levels, and how do you guarantee the purity of the dose. I understand there, some of that has been addressed here, but certainly not the therapeutic level, the dosing level, what are the side effects. Those things are not addressed in this legislation. And it is my fear that by not doing so and building medical marijuana upon this shaky foundation that does not include science, is going to relegate medical marijuana to anecdotal evidence like it currently is. The better solution is what we passed out of this body, the resolution yesterday, calling upon Congress to allow for the research that is needed to determine what may or may not be effective and for which conditions. So those things, those are the reasons why I cannot support this bill today. In addition, we talk about the fact that we are now making Minnesota law that is contrary to federal law. You know, I think about the serenity prayer, and that is knowing, in a sense, where your circle of influence is. We should be focusing on those things that are in the Minnesota preview and not what is under the federal preview at this point. So this law is contrary to federal law, but most importantly, it's not built upon the scientific information and data that would be needed to get medical marijuana from anecdotal evidence to strong scientific evidence that would allow accurate prescribing. Senator Westrom. Madam President, uh, would uh, Senator Dibble yield for a couple of questions? He will yield. Uh, Madam President, uh, Senator Dibble, um, Senator Ingebrigtsen talked about the ID card that was in the Senate bill, and now it's not in this conference report. Um, I know you said there's a <coughs> rulemaking uh, ability, but can you tell me why why we took that safeguard out of this bill, uh, Senator Dibble? Why, what was the House's uh, position and rejection of that, uh, really what was seemed like a common-sense safeguard to help uh, ensure this was intended and being used by those that uh, had the right uh, paperwork and uh, diagnosis. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Westrom. Um, part of, I think part of the uh, motivation was, uh, was cost, uh, and, and part of the motivation was that um, the uh, registry uh, verification system uh, could be developed in conjunction uh, with the manufacturers uh, and, and working with the, uh, the commissioner um, to make sure that there's a, a strong system of verification um, that, that may or may not include cards um, and, and a means by which uh, the cost of those cards could be uh, accounted for and recaptured. Um, but keep in mind, um, uh, Senator Westrom, um, the bill that went out of the Senate um, was in large measure uh, self-supporting uh, through fees. Um, the, the proposal in front of us um, is a different approach uh, in, and uh, does require um, some level of support ongoing from the state's general fund, and so there was some sensitivity to cost as well. Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. Uh, Senator Dibble, if you'd yield for another question. He will yield. Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Dibble, uh, I've been uh, trying to talk to a variety of people uh, on this issue um, an interesting question came up to me uh, by a medical doctor in that they give DOT certifications or physical uh, physicals and uh, Senator Dibble 
his impression or concern is that even though we we would authorize or permit uh, some medical use of cannabis here in Minnesota, uh, any of his patients uh, that have commercial vehicle license uh, physicals uh, would be uh, strictly prohibited from that. Is that your interpretation as well, or would there be a, a, a waiver or a different scenario that would be uh, uh, in in play at that point in time, but it, it kind of raised a real uh, dichotomy or a, or a concern that, that they raised to me. Uh, can, do you have any uh, response or, or comment on that, uh, Senator Dibble? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Westrom. I'd be interested in knowing specifically why they have that concern. I think we provide for uh, a balance and equilibrium between uh, uh, discrimination protection for employment purposes, but also providing, as in the conversation I had earlier with Senator Franzen providing for, um, you know, ensuring that uh, folks um, aren't, conduct, you know, aren't engaging in their professional responsibilities in a, a professionally negligent manner, um, that, that they're not on the work premises uh, while under the influence, that they're not operating vehicles uh, while under the influence. Well, Mr. Senator Wester. Mr. President, um, Senator Dibble, uh, I guess a follow-up to that, uh, Senator Dibble, I think the concern is uh, with anybody that gets a, a CDL or commercial driver's license uh, in their jobs, they have to be subject, subject to a, a drug test uh, first to uh, pass, pass uh, uh, the job interview in many cases and then uh, random tests along the way. Uh, so I think, uh, Senator Dibble, that, that becomes the, the catch-22 uh, are you saying that this would give them uh, an exemption from uh, federal commercial driver's license uh, drug test requirements? Uh, is, is that your understanding, or, or how does that square, uh, Senator Dibble? Senator Dibble. Mr. President, Senator Westrom, um, in the uh, non-discrimination, uh, the discrimination prohibited section, um, where we uh, deal with employment matters, uh, a, a person cannot be discriminated against in hiring, termination, or any term of or condition of employment. Um, like I said, you know, except providing for you know professional uh, duties and responsibilities. It goes on to say that the patient's positive drug test for cannabis components or metabolites, uh, unless the pr patient used, possessed, or was impaired by a medical cannabis on the premise of the place of employment or during the hours of employment. Um, so. Um, so, so you have to read that in the negative. A person cannot be discriminated for their positive drug test uh, unless, of course, they were under the influence on the premise of, em uh, on the premise of employment. Um, it says also an employee who is required to undergo employer drug testing um, may present verification of enrollment in the patient registry as part of the employee's explanation. And then there's some statutory citations. So, Mr. Senator Pres Wester. Mr. President, Senator Dibble, uh, thank you for that. Is uh, is your understanding then that that would would leave those employees without any federal uh, uh, retribution or federal law that would that would prevail, or are you aware of any federal laws that would uh, uh, take precedent over over that uh, exemption, uh, Senator Dibble? If you can answer that, Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, Senator Westrom, as, as you know, um, being an attorney, uh, it's hard for, uh, I think you're an attorney, is that true? Um, that uh, it's hard for state law to supersede federal law, so I, you know, I can't answer your question specifically. I can just point you to the language of the proposal um, that you know, folks cannot be discriminated in employment um, you know, unless there's uh, you know, a valid reason, as I described, and if they are forced to undergo uh, drug testing and they test positive for cannabis, um, they can show that they are a part of the medical cannabis uh, patient registry. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, uh, thank you. Senator Dibble, one more area I'd like to just talk to you about is the pharmaceutical uh, dispensary. Uh, in your introduction, and uh, as the way it reads, uh, the state would actually license uh, a dispensary or a, as, a, as a pharmaceutical license. I think you referred to it in your uh, opening comments. Uh, the state pharmacist uh, would would dispense this. Can you 
explain uh, explain a little more uh, clarity on, around that. And uh, is this a regular pharmacist, uh, like you would think of uh, one of our local uh, pharmacies in this in the state, uh, Senator Dibble, or what's the distinction or difference between uh, these pharmacists and uh, what might be at uh, Walgreens, Walmart, Target, uh, you name the pharmacy, uh, uh, CVS. Uh, you, can you can you um, tell us if they're the same, or is there some difference when you refer to uh, the pharmacist in this case? Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Senator Westrom, I, I don't think I described the uh, distribution center as a pharmacy. Um, it would not be a pharmacy um, or licensed as such. Um, uh, however, it is uh, required that manufacturers um, uh, re require that employees licensed as pharmacists uh, in Minnesota uh, be the only employees to distribute uh, the medical cannabis uh, to a patient. Um, and they also have um, some responsibility uh, to have some conversation uh, with, the, uh, with the patient uh, about the, the uh, I'll read it here. Uh, consult with the patient to determine the proper dosage for the patient after reviewing the ranges of chemical compositions of medical cannabis and the ranges of proper, proper dosages reported by the commissioner. Um, uh, we do provide for um, uh, some, some exemptions because, of course, they're going to be dispensing uh, a, a product that pharmacists are otherwise not allowed uh, to dispense. Um, but, no, they wouldn't be operating in a classic pharmacy, but it is a pharmacist um, who needs to be the one who's doing the, dis dis the dispensing and the consultation. Senator Westrup. So, Mr. President, uh, Senator Dibble, uh, that, that pharmacist uh, as licensed, uh, who are they going to be? Are they going to be somebody with pharmaceutical training? It's just they get a separate license in the state of Minnesota? Or can it be just anybody that works for the company? Uh, and, and then will they act uh, like a pharmacist in the sense that Will there be labels and uh, dosage uh, maximums or uh, suggested uh, ways to take it uh, for, the, for the patient, uh, just like you have current uh, pharmacies where it'll say uh, take one every four hours or, or that? Uh, can you explain a little bit more on the pharmacy front uh, of these, what you said, I think, as a licensed pharmacist? Senator Dibble. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, yes, uh, Senator Westrom, I think I, I just did that. They would uh, work with the patient. Uh, you know, uh, who, who presents with a particular uh, condition or uh, diagnosis, of course, that's made by that, that patient's practitioner. Um, they'll be utilizing uh, the information um, that the commissioner has compiled that I described earlier in the presentation of the bill. Um, the commissioner is tasked with, with uh, reporting on all of the available research uh, about available forms of cannabis um, uh, components, uh, those sorts of things and what is shown to be potentially beneficial to particular conditions. The pharmacist has that consultation, that conversation uh, with the patient to make those determinations. Senator Rood. Mr. Chair and members, um, I hadn't planned on speaking today, but we've been talking about all the people that this will help. I heard the number 33,000 people that this will help. And I'd like to know about the 33,000 people that this could devastate their lives because we never talk about that part. And I will tell you that drugs, when they enter your family, unassuming, you don't know that it's happening, your teenager, your brother, your sister, wherever it comes, it's devastating in families. And I know we have people in this chamber whose families have been devastated by drugs. And I will tell you, my sissy was at 13, first chair violin, straight-A student, the pride in our family. She was the smart one. And that was the 70s, and when she was 14, she started to dabble with marijuana. At first, it was just a joint here that they snuck, and it was no big deal. That was the 70s. That's what people did. But marijuana always leads to something else, and don't ever fool yourself to think that it doesn't. So my bright young sister never graduated from high school, and she never went on to college. And she's been gone for eight years now, and she had a pretty tough life, and it all started with marijuana. So if you think that this is just a simple drug, 
that will help 33,000 people. Think of the people that's lives that will devastate because that's what would happen when you legalize this drug. You need to think about all those people that the drug, it will get into our society. It will change the face of Minnesota people and don't think it won't. And today I've heard this really disingenuous conversation about medical cannabis. Folks, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So we think that by changing it to medical cannabis, it sounds better to the state of Minnesota. They will think, well, this must, we changed the name, it's cannabis, it's not marijuana. We're fooling no one, people. That's just such a disingenuous conversation. This is legalizing a drug. This is legalizing marijuana. It's just not medical Mr. cannabis. Mr. President. And so I ask for a no vote today and think about the future of Minnesota. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Mr. President, I, I object to the characterization of my presentation of my bill as disingenuous. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And I have no more questions, and I'm not going to belabor this any longer. And I think I may have said that the last time I got up, members. But I, I, I can't go home without at least giving you a couple of the facts that I that I just recently talked with a person that worked for the Department of Health for many years, Senator Dibble. You know who it is, uh, uh, Senator Limmer, who and, and probably Senator Latz, no doubt, uh, Carol Falkowski, who worked with the Department of health for many years, and, and her primary job members was to research children and children's drug abuse, uh, including alcohol, throughout the state of Minnesota. And you can find her references that I'm going to be talking about here in a book that she just wrote. It's called Reefer Sadness, published in April 2014. And members, here are some alarming statistics, and this is what we didn't hear in their committees. Senator Rosen talked about it, Senator uh, several others to talked about what was missing uh, from the testimony and and uh, those are those of the parents that have lost family members to drug abuse the family members that are now dealing with children that are in homes right now that are going through rehabilitation members it's three hundred dollars a day we're spending on rehabilitation, $300 a day for many, many people in the state of Minnesota. And members, I have to, if I can, find, if I can throw this sheriff thing out for, for just a, a couple of minutes here, if you can just look at me without seeing a uniform and a, and a badge and a gun, and as a grandparent and as a parent, and I've mentioned this before to, to a couple members, I genuinely am very concerned about where this is going to go, and these, this is the reason why in her study. And let me, let me just read a couple of sentences, and I'll sit down. From 2012 to 2013, medical use increased among 8th and 10th graders, increased among 8th and 10th graders, and held steady among high school seniors. 22.7% used in the past month, and 36.4% in the past year. 45% reported lifetime use, members. And here's the caveat that I think, and members, I'm going to say this and say it time and again. I so hope that I'm wrong. I am so hope that I, all my, my, my testimony and all my experiences with this drug is so wrong that we don't go towards recreational marijuana. But listen to this. The states that allowed medical marijuana, in those states, one-third of marijuana-using kids reported obtaining it from somebody else's medical prescription. Six percent of those had their own marijuana prescription. Members, I so stand here so, so boldly and tell you that I hope I am so wrong. But the track record is, is such throughout the United States that this is step number one. Helping 7,000 people is step number one to what could be a Colorado in the near future. Members, don't vote for this bill. Further discussion on uh, Senate File 2470? Seeing none. 
Senator Dibble moves that the foregoing recommendations of the Conference Committee on Senate File 2470 be now adopted and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Conference Committee. All those in favor, signify by say aye. aye. Opposed, motion prevails. Any further discussion on the bill? Secretary, Senator Dibble. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Uh, President. I just wanted to give one uh, little final uh, concluding uh, comment and statement just to say um, uh, thank you to Senator Ingebrigtsen, and Senator Rosen and, and all the others um, who express uh, concern. I, I very much appreciate and I um, respect uh, your perspectives um, uh, and uh, I respect your contribution to this conversation fully and, and uh, regard you uh, very highly as, as colleagues. Um, I, I do, Senator Ingebrigtsen, I do think you're wrong. Um, as you said, you hope you are. I think the research shows um, that uh, in those states that do this well, uh, and actually states that even don't do this so, so well, um, there is no increased use of marijuana for recreational purposes by teenagers uh, or, or other folks. This does not lead to that. Um, this is not about moving down the path to recreational use. This is about uh, getting something into the hands of people who now lack it, who have no other available options that are any good at all. People who are suffering, people who have been asking us to do this for many, many years, uh, there is evidence, there is research that shows the benefits, and we know for a fact that some of the substances that supposedly do help these folks actually harm them in, in many ways. The things that have been through the much vaunted FDA approval process, expensive, addictive, side effects that are damaging, uh, even uh, life-threatening. Uh, and so we're trying uh, to take this step in a measured way. I regret, I fully regret that uh, it's not the bill um, that came out of the Senate um, that doesn't reach as many folks. There is a process for, for moving down uh, that path. Um, so I believe this is a first step uh, and an opportunity uh, to do something um, that will be really important for Minnesotans and that we can build on in the future and do in a way that supports a lot of competing goals. Um, and, I, and I do want to thank all of the advocates, the families uh, who have spent countless hours here advocating on behalf of themselves and their kids. Um, I do give some credit uh, to Commissioner Ellinger and, and absolutely give credit uh, to the governor who has figured out a path and, and started working with us in the last number of weeks uh, to figure out a way to take this step, figure out uh, a pro a pr an approach to this whole matter that might work. Uh, and so, members, I thank you for your time. It's been a good process, uh, a lot of vigorous debate. It's the way the legislature is designed to work, and I urge support for this. Thank you. Senator Bach. Well, Mr. President, members, I, I think when most of us came into this legislation, legislative session in February, we didn't think we were going to be where we are here tonight. I, I think this was not on the legislative agenda of most of us in this room. And I think what that tells me is this is a wonderful example how, of how representative democracy works. A small group of families with their hurting children came to their state capitol and they changed the law. They didn't hire one of the big Twin City law firms with lobbyists. They came here and they came to my office and they came to many of your offices. A small group of committee families who only wanted to improve the life of their children. And I can tell you I'm going to be pretty proud voting green tonight because it is going to help improve the quality of life of some people in Minnesota that we don't even know. And we're going to be able to take a vote and, and help improve their quality of life. And it reminds me a little bit of a, a little phrase that I have on my desk at home, and it's attributed to Margaret Mead when she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. So to those families that put all the time in, did all the hard work, and we saw them here, the struggle it was for them to be here, I especially want to thank them because a whole lot of other families, uh, loved ones, are going to benefit by the sacrifice that they made to come here to the Capitol to advocate and, frankly, to push, and to push very hard. This was very much an uphill struggle to get this bill to where it's at tonight. And Representative Moline deserves special recognition for the effort that she put into this. And Senator Dibble, thank you for your incredible uh, effort in, in moving this bill through uh, members. And, and uh, I would 
I would like you to think about a green vote. Secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate file number 2470, a bill for an act relating to education, authorizing an innovative partnership to deliver certain technology and educational services. Secretary will take the roll. There being 40, Secretary will close the roll. There being 46 ayes and 16 nays, the bill is passed and is titled agreed to.